Good afternoon, Cape Town. Wait, I've got to do this. Shoops. <laughs> My name is Ivo Fechter. I'm a columnist. And I'm here to tell you that bananas are scary and MSG is good for you. <laughs> you see, we've been conditioned to fear risk and to avoid it right now. Bananas are scary and MSG is good for you. It's not easy to calmly assess risk, right? It's harder still to evaluate it against its potential benefits. So what we do is we tend to shortcut the decision. We often rely on people we suspect are better informed than we are, especially if those claims tend to agree with our own emotions or intuitions or prejudices. It's ingrained in us to err on the side of caution. For example, we're conditioned to fear chemicals, right? We contrast them with natural substances, and we worry that they'll give us cancer. But this is a completely irrational distinction to make. Apples and almonds contain cyanide. Right? Nutmeg is a deadly hallucinogenic. Castor beans contain ricin, which is a chemical warfare agent. A single castor bean can kill an adult human. When you protested at being force-fed castor oil as a kid, right, you really did know better than your parents. And you also knew better if you were never afraid of snacks containing MSG. Right? Few chemicals have a worse reputation than monosodium glutamate, and few deserve their reputation less. The term might sound very awful, but then so does isothiocyanate, which is an ingredient in broccoli and is an anti-cancer agent. Or acetaldehyde, which is also in broccoli, except that this one does cause cancer. MSG has its origins in seaweed extract, which the Japanese have used forever to season bland rice-based dishes. Right. Kikuna Ikeda, uh, a Japanese scientist, he isolated it in the hope of making cheap mass-produced food taste better, right, and so ward off malnutrition among the working masses. Other products of this line of research? Beef broth and yeast extract. Right. You see, what they found was something called glutamate, of which monosodium glutamate is just the most common salt. It is found not only in seaweed, but also in such tasty treats as soy sauce, anchovies, and parmesan cheese. It's responsible for the fifth commonly identified taste sensation, in addition to sweet, salty, sour, and bitter. Uh, the Japanese call it umami, or the good taste. We might call it savory. But health nuts are dead against it. Right? They say it causes Chinese restaurant syndrome. Now, this is only true if you're both allergic to MSG and too stuck in your condescending xenophobia to trouble yourself much about the fact that it is a Japanese seasoning, 90% of which is used in perfectly ordinary non-Chinese food. <laughs> they say it'll make you fat and ugly, which is really a judgmental way to restate Professor Ikeda's thesis that um, if food is not tasty, people eat less of it. They say that we're dying of cancer, which is true in a way, but mostly because gangrene, smallpox consumption, and the flu no longer get us first. <laughs> like stroke and heart disease, cancer is a disease of age. If you live a healthy and long enough life, cancer will get you in the end. <laughs> if you're just for aging, and you exclude smokers, cancer incidence is actually decreasing, and so are death rates. Right? The notion that food additives are killing us isn't showing up at the hospitals. But it gets better. What do we know that does make food more tasty? Ordinary sodium chloride. Right? And fat. Right? You fatten a calf for the slaughter, not just to make more calf, but to make what little calf there is tastier. Now, what do we know about salt and fat? It'll steal your mojo, baby. <laughs> and what do we know that replaces fat and salt? Bingo. So, here we have a traditional seaweed extract, which occurs naturally in many tasty foods. It doesn't cause cancer. It helps make bland but nutritious food taste better. And it cuts down on fat and salt intake. Frankly, 
I can't think of a better health food than MSG. <laughs> now, the reason I found this marvelous little story about our fears and neurosis was because a year or two ago, someone asked me what I thought about fracking the Karoo. Uh, the connection will become clear in a minute. Um, I was inclined to oppose whatever fracking was, right, because it sounds like a pretty perverse thing to do out in the desert. Also, the newspapers told us it would make water burn and ruin South Africa's wild open spaces. Fracking, said a crazy adventurer named Lewis Pugh, would destroy the Karoo, it would poison our drinking water, and it would dishonor those who died for our freedom. We had a moral choice, he said, between water and gas, between good and evil. Our constitution was at risk of being shredded by greedy oil companies, and, like the Madibas and Mahatmas of yesteryear, we had to fight this. Right, the headlines and protest signs kind of wrote themselves, right? Frack off. No fracking way. <laughs> Don't frack with our Karoo. <laughs> but as a journalist, I tend to be skeptical of such high-flown emotive rhetoric, right? If something sounds too good to be true, it usually is. And if something sounds too scary for words, I also investigate. Uh, invariably, I find, I find that my skepticism is well-founded. So I looked into it, and I found that gas drilling by means of hydraulic fracturing, or fracking as it's commonly called, was nowhere near as scary as the Green Movement would have you believe. No. Flaming tap water actually predates shale gas drilling. <laughs> Methane is common in water wells. Right? It's a fire hazard, but it's not toxic. That surface impact photo, it's not of a shale gas play, but one of the densest coal bed methane fields in the world. And the Karoo won't look anything like it. Besides, as we heard this morning, everybody loves the SKA radio telescope project. <laughs> Nobody ever whines about its surface impact. The drinking water in Dimock, Pennsylvania, which is ground zero for water contamination claims, was tested by four separate regulatory agencies and turned out to be perfectly fine to drink. So when I wrote about all this, right, I got drowned in comments. I spent 18 hours a day for seven days solid fielding responses. Emotions raged high. Accusations came flying thick and fast. Right? I must be a cretin, or callous, or corrupt, or all of the above. A publisher took note and asked me to write a book about environmental exaggeration and how it harms emerging economies. And that became the book that took me on this fascinating journey. I traveled to some crazy places. I debated some amazing people. I, what I did, I chose the most challenging examples to research, right? Cases that didn't obviously suit my narrative. Like oil spills, food additives, right? pesticides, and nuclear incidents. I wanted to test my convictions to see if even the hard cases would support my idea that we routinely exaggerate and, over, and overreact to our fears. And as it turned out, they did. Environmental exaggeration is routine. Right? The green movement uses the exact same marketing techniques as the corporate sector. Right? They will lie, exaggerate, or spin just as often. Right? One difference, the media isn't primed to distrust them. Right? In fact, journalists are often activists themselves. Let me give you one more example of exaggeration before we turn to the consequences. When a massive earthquake and tsunami hit Japan on the 11th of March, 2011, one of its oldest and largest nuclear, uh, nuclear power stations uh, was destroyed and went into meltdown. Right? How many people died? Zero. 20,000 people did die, but not at Fukushima. The disaster is more properly known as the Great Tohoku earthquake and tsunami. Yet why do we all call it Fukushima? Well, you see, the thing is, most of the news stories relegated the human death and misery to the last paragraph. Right? The real story was the scary sensationalism of radioactive milk and mutant fish. And that turned out to be largely a non-story. Right, now, that's not to say we should take nuclear safety lightly. So, let's consider energy sources in terms of safety. Here are all the major sources of electricity, ranked by how many people die per unit of power produced. Right, coal mines are deadly. Every day, 30 people die down coal mines. Working on an oil rig, it's a tough and dangerous job. Gas is considerably safer, even more so than farming. And nuclear turns out to be safer even than wind and solar power. Have you ever thought how many people fall off roofs installing solar panels? <laughs> <laughs> and 
Accidents like Fukushima don't demonstrate the dangers of nuclear power. They demonstrate how safe it is. And even George Monbiot says so. Now, where do you think most radiation comes from anyway? Right. Nuclear power, the little red slice at the top there, is by far the smallest source of radiation exposure. Medical treatments and the air and the buildings around us expose us to vastly more radiation than the nuclear industry ever will. Right. Did you know that in normal operation, a coal-fired power station spews 100 times more radioactivity into the air than a nuclear power plant? Did you know that between 1945 and 1998, while most nuclear power stations were quietly churning out reliable, clean energy, over 2,000 nuclear bombs were set off around the world. But notice the yellow slice up at the top there. That represents radiation in our food. Take the humble banana. Right? The very symbol of healthy food, right? They're not scary, are they? <laughs> well, are they? Truth be told, this guy is selling you something that you would struggle to get past an airport radiation detector. Bananas, like many fruits and legumes, absorb radioactive potassium from the soil. A truck full of them is equivalent to a kilo of low-level radioactive waste. And guess what happens to all the bananas and nuts we eat? Our bodies absorb the radioactive isotopes and deposit them out of the way in our bones. We are all radioactive. Right. Truly, people. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Bananas <laughs> are terrifying. <laughs> now, see what I just did. I did exactly what activists do when they rail against radioactivity or pollution or fracking or chemicals in our food. Take a very small hazard or a very low risk and blow it way out of proportion. Right, the message that the environment is resilient and can handle some disturbance or that our bodies are designed to deal with a little poison, doesn't suit their marketing agenda. And here's the danger. Thanks to all this scaremongering and uh, public alarm, Japan promptly decided to phase out nuclear power in favor of green energy. Right. That happened to be a little bit easier said than done. So what happened? Japan rejected the safest source of energy on the planet, and because green energy is still very expensive, they've been turning to the most dirty and least safe source known to man. Well done to the green lobby. Within days of the Fukushima meltdown, Angela Merkel announced that she would close all of Germany's nuclear plants and replace them with green energy. All right, is Germany doing any better than Japan? No siree, it's also heading back to the coal-fired 19th century. Well done to the green lobby. The Washington Post, which isn't exactly famed for its right-wing bias, minced no words. Instead of a model for the world to emulate, Europe has become a model of what not to do. All right, here's the hard reality. Europe is suffering from rising electricity prices, which affects everything from industrial productivity to household income. All right. Japan, post-Fukushima, is rapidly catching up. And the one country that jumped to take advantage of shale gas has cheaper power today than it did before the economic downturn. But, what environmental price did the U.S. pay? Well, surprisingly, perhaps, not very much. Gas almost completely eliminates pollutants like mercury, nitrogen oxides, uh, sulfur, and particulates, when compared to coal and oil. Right. There are anecdotal reports of some localized pollution, but the risk seems no worse than any, any other industry. And as for greenhouse gases, here's a comparison between the United States in blue and the Kyoto signatories in red. Now, the first thing to notice about this chart is that reducing emissions and economic hardship go hand in hand. The second is that even without having signed the Kyoto Treaty, the U.S. is back at levels last seen in the early 1990s, in large part thanks to shale gas. Now, if you plot a trend line on the pre- and post-Kyoto period, right, before the crash of 2008 and the shale gas boom that started around the same time, you'll see that U.S. emissions were actually slowing down faster than those of Kyoto signatories. The costly bureaucratic intervention favored by the prophets of doom appears to have been perfectly pointless. Now, why are lower emissions and cheaper electricity in America relevant to South Africa? Well, not only because we also unwisely tend to sign up for expensive but ineffective commitments like Kyoto, not only because we also happily appear to have a lot of shale gas, but because our electricity is already unaffordable. We are paying rich world prices to fuel a poor economy. Right? 
And once again, the US is way out ahead, thanks in large part to competition from shale gas and less of a tendency to overreact in environmental policy choices. What do you think South Africa's industries do when faced with scarce and more expensive energy? Hire more people? No, they scale back production, they cancel marginal projects, and they cut costs. And what do you think South Africa's poor do when faced with high electricity prices? Put solar panels on their shacks? No. They revert to burning wood, coal, and paraffin and give their babies asthma before they burn down the neighborhood. No. Environmental exaggeration can actually harm health, safety, and the environment. Compare the scorched earth of South Africa's poor townships with the lush greenery of Franschhoek or Dahlstrom, and tell me that poverty and stagnation is better for the environment than prosperity and growth. Exaggeration clouds our minds with fear. Excessive risk aversion paralyzes us. It promotes ever more red tape, and it actually makes us poorer. Excessive regulation is even counterproductive for the environment. It might make us feel virtuous, and responsible, <laughs> but it does very real harm to people. It threatens the fight against poverty and the struggle to improve our quality of life. The green fringe likes to think of itself as progressive and liberal, but it isn't. It's afraid of change. It is fundamentally conservative. When it yells stop, do stop and think again. Far too often you'll hear alarmism and exaggeration. You'll hear emotive appeals weakly supported in science. When people yell stop, they hamper progress and exacerbate poverty. Now that gives us a moral choice between good and evil. So next time you hear activists claim that MSG is poison, or you see an advert that says bananas are harmless, be skeptical. Question everything. <laughs> I'd like to thank you, ladies and gentlemen.